Hello everyone. Welcome back to the software world with John Dost. And I am John Dost, your host. And today uh, our topic is DevOps and Site Reliability Engineering as a Carrier. And my guest is uh, Rene Hernandez. And Rene is a senior DevOps engineer at Fullscript. And we will talk about the DevOps uh, with Rene today. Welcome, Rene. How are you? Thank you very much. Um, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks again for, for the invite, John Dost. Um, as you said, my name is Rene, and I'm a software engineer by trade, and especially focus on DevOps practice, practices lately. Uh, I work at Fullscript close to two years now, and I've uh, been focusing on like all the different aspects of, uh, of the processing, pipeline, infrastructure, uh, deployment, uh, or survivability monitoring uh, within the DevOps group. Yeah. Um, like could you give us a bit more information about your background? Like, where did you start? Like, who is Rene, for example? Okay, so I am originally from Cuba, and I did my bachelor degree in Cuba. While I was work, while I was doing my my studies, I I started contributing with a with a remote company, and I started learn, learned uh, Ruby at the time, and eventually start getting involved in like uh, deploying the code. Back then, like that implied to you connect to a remote server and you in manually copy and deploy uh, your files those times that that was all that was that always felt weird and bad that, that wasn't the right way to do things anyways i finished my my bachelor degree i came to canada ottawa specifically to do my master's program once i finished i start working on the industry and move around a little bit until i uh, get in full script when i'm currently working on but yeah um it's so nice to have like people from all around the world i mean i i, I had some uh, so we had some guests here uh from i don't know brazil from europe from some other parts of the world it's it's so amazing to like having this as a setup to meet with new people and get to know other people as well uh, thanks a lot yeah um since we our topic is devops and one thing is not clear for me in general uh, is what is DevOps? Because like everyone talks about DevOps, everyone says, okay, DevOps is a really wide topic. Yeah, okay. But um, what does a DevOps engineer do in general? That That is an interesting question. DevOps, it's hard for people to agree what DevOps, what DevOps is. So you can look online and you're going to find like a different number of answers and definitions and concepts. A common, usually we can define it as uh, the integration between processes, people, and, and products. And the objective of DevOps around this is to align. Initially, it was focused on aligning development and operations towards like common goals of like shipping and releasing features faster to, to end users, while at the same time maintaining or improving the reliability of the, of the services. I mean, over time that has grown and DevOps nowadays usually includes uh, security, and it's also called like DevSecOps and other adjacent areas of the of any companies, right? Uh, compliance, uh, finance, all all those things slowly like they start to integrate towards more uh, agile and more aligned uh, a structure towards the common goal of the company, which is to improve, uh, provide better service, increase benefit uh, earnings. And, and so on. So with that said, DevOps per se is not a title. It, should, it shouldn't be a job description doing DevOps because at, at the end, DevOps is around all, all the human aspect of integrating like people's different team and processes. Over time, the term, the term got co-opted and we have like DevOps uh, position nowadays. My, my title is a, has DevOps on his name, on his name, right? So on a day to day, Depending on the company, you can be doing different different things. On on my case, on a day-to-day -day basis, I can work on automating the deployment of a new of a new product, of a new service within our internal or either internal or external facing. I can also work on improving the the speed of uh, of our deployment pipelines, and this is important because faster deployment pipeline it means that we get faster feedback of the changes and the developers are more engaged on the on, on a day-to-day -day and uh, on the operations and the deployments of their changes. 
as well, we can, I may work on improving the observability of the system. And this is important when we are facing I don't know, unexpected events or, or accidents or even an attack. You, you want to have a good observability and monitoring tool so you can quickly determine what are the issues that you are currently facing. And this is especially important if you are doing an, if you are part of an on-call rotation. So you need to be able to you need to be able to do two things: zoom out so you can see the whole context of what is happening, and at the same time zoom in deep so you can determine exactly what is what is happening. And last but not least, usually when you are in a DevOps role, you you are involved in a lot of cross-team uh, work. So it requires soft skills are important in in this role. They're important in any role, but especially in this type of roles, because the success of your job not always depend entirely on you. It's on the result that the cross-team uh, interactions produce. Generally, my uh, like that what uh, a bit confuses me because like whenever I see the DevOps like or people working in DevOps uh, are doing things most of the time affecting many many people at the same time. And I understand the, like, for example, you talked about the um, fast feedback cycles uh, with continuous uh, delivery and et cetera, like helping people to reach their goals. And like, but at the same time, you need to zoom out, see the big goals. Like, this is what confuses me a little bit, because when you, when I think about a software engineer, gen, most of the time they have the uh, goal of I don't know, maybe feature release, maybe they are developing API and et cetera, doing things. And most of the time, if I think about the backend engineering, for example, um, they are responsible for the day from their services. They're responsible of them and then they are deploying these services. They are setting up continuous development pipelines, continuous integration pipelines, and it's just like all pipelines they are setting up. Then I step back and I say, okay, backend engineer does this all things around the, their service because they own it. And then when I think about DevOps, how does it fit into here? Like backend engineer has these responsibilities. I mean, in some companies they are separated, of course, for sure. But um, in let's say small to medium sized companies, uh, it's more of a backend, on backend engineer's shoulder, also in growing companies. And mm. when we put the DevOps into the equation, how can we fit into the backend engineers? How can we help, for example, take some responsibilities if it's if it's the job? Mm. At the end, this is this depends a lot in the context of the yeah. company that you are. But I would say that when you start introducing DevOps or SRE roles, they will start focusing on all the automation around your infrastructure, your pipelines, the monitoring, uh, making it easier to get feedback. On, on changes and that, that feedback reaches the correct person on time. Um, also, especially nowadays with cloud, a lot of these responsibilities are transferred to managed service that we run on clouds. So DevOps and SRE people start to think on, on a higher level, like how we integrate those services and how we make it easier for those services to be consumed by our developers, either front end or back end. And the front end and back end uh, lines are becoming uh, fussy over time due to like new developments in, in JavaScript and and the likes. So so that's one point. The other point is like you can start integrating instead of having a separated DevOps or SRE team, you can build them within your existing uh, back end or front end teams. So you you may start by having a dedicated person who, whose focus is gonna be on like the automation for this for this project, they do like maybe some feature work, but by the, their focus over time tend to, to move towards like making easier to work instead of doing uh, like business focus work. Mm, yeah, I understand your, I understand general how we can fit the position. That's okay, that's, that part is more clear. Um, I'm still considering like, for example, let's let's keep the microservices. For example, let's let's take okay. it. And we are operating with microservices arch architecture in the company, mm -hmm. and which means that the services will be very very small. And then you of course need to build pipelines for every service, but generally mm -hmm. these tend to be more on a 
boilerplate style. You know, you have one bo boilerplate, which when you create a new microservice, you just create from the boilerplate, which comes with all the pipelines, okay. etc. Then what does the DevOps do here? Like we have the engineers then. Mm. Okay. So in, in that scenario, you start to see happening in different companies, like the creation of, of platform teams. And the focus there is like building the, all the guardrails and or all the common use cases that each team is going to have, is going to have. So each individual team doesn't have to spend the time building the blocks. So that platform team will provide reusable blocks so that the teams can assemble and then they can get up and running in a matter of minutes instead of uh, days by having to to build from scratch all these uh, blocks. Like, and by blocks, I'm, I'm, I mean like the CI and CD pipelines, um, the monitoring for, for your deployments, the automation to deploy the infrastructure either on cloud or on a, on a data center and all the, I mean, all the tracking of the source code, that's, that's a given nowadays, but that could also fall on the responsibility of the, of the DevOps team and all the automation that you may have around all these, these areas, like ch uh, chat ops to make easy to, to interconnect and get feedback on directly on a Slack, uh, on call paging for, for product business, product focused uh, team. That's something that we have in, in our company, company, for example, the developers, have a daily on call rotation during business hours. So they are they they get paid when there is any alert from the from the product as well as we also get alert on that. Talked about on call uh, in a couple of weeks before with uh, another uh, great person called uh, his name was Serhat. And then um, we talked about on call but on call I also it's it's a bit um, I find I found it tricky to handle, especially so when you have a DevOps a one team working on DevOps, and when mm -hmm. you have the engineers because you need to spread the the responsibility for both sides, and that is not very clear to me still. Even though after we talk with uh, Serhat, that how can we have the on call rotation? I mean, for example, I as a bank and engineer, I built the service. And it makes sense for me to take care of if it goes down, you know, because I know how it operates. I know how everything is set up and et cetera. But how do we place, like in your company, for example, you said that you have, you are in also, you get paged. And how do you have fit this uh, DevOps or the, the, the engineer working on DevOps into the on-call here? Like in non-business times as well. So that's a good point. When, when, we, when we are doing on-call, like, if I'm in on call, part of the focus is to be be capable of redirect like the alerts that you get to the best person to to solve it. It doesn't mean that you always have to be the one that uh, resolve the alert. You are the you are the hub that directs all the incoming alerts to to who to what to whatever people uh, can take care of. And if you are the one that can solve it, then even better, right? Um, we also get those alerts that are uh, product focused as a backup in case of the of the on-call person from the product team is not is not available, so we can we can track it and like follow up with it, with any of the teams that uh, may be impacted by that. But it's important for product uh, teams to be on call because they have context that we don't that we don't have. Like they are the ones that develop the code, like know why the features, know the, know how the code was implemented and why it was implemented. And although I'm familiar with the code, it probably would take me way more time to figure out why it's happening than if they were uh, if they are the ones doing the, the investigation and resolution so we tend to split the the on call in two levels in this scenario when we have the when it's pros focus uh, alert the on call person for for the product team uh, address it during business hours and we focus on the unknown all the other alerts that are non product focus like infrastructure changes, networking, uh, uh, downstream dependent services that are down, um, pipeline change that causes issues, that's our focus with the help of uh, product uh, developers uh, members to resolve any issue on the pipeline. After business hours, the responsibilities shift. We only, the main focus after business hours is on P1 alerts, which usually means that there is an extreme issue, like the site is down, your infrastructure has, down you lost networking 
and usually that doesn't involve uh, developers. And worst case, worst case scenario, and we're seeing some impact on on the pro due to something that we are able to identify that was released during the day. We still have the ability to roll back changes automatically. Uh, manually, we can do it. And in the majority of the cases, that resolution can wait until the next day once the developers are uh, back online and we can figure it out without the stress of the nighttime what what happened and why and provide like a proper uh, fix. Okay. Now, yeah, in, in title, we said site reliable to engineering. Now I'm in my head, it also like comes to point that, okay, where do we fit this SRE here? Like what does, SR, okay, let's start from top. What does a uh, site reliable to engineer do in general? That, that's <laughs> an interesting, right? <laughs> interesting topic. Right. The history of uh, SRE, site reliable yeah. engineer, is that it was developed in parallel by Google while many companies in in open communications and open platform platforms were building what is DevOps uh, today. Mm -hmm. SRE came from from within Google. It developed in Google, like Google is, is a massive company. So the practice, they got a lot of iterations on the practices uh, of what SRE means. Yeah. And usually you will see online that people will say that SRE is an implementation of DevOps. So it's a particular way of doing DevOps uh, in the context of uh, of Google and some other companies. One thing that is interesting is once once the SRE started to be exported, of, let's call it exported outside of Google, like companies are starting to implement SRE. What happened there is like a lot of companies didn't didn't plan properly to how define what SRE means within their companies, and they try to copy all the practices. As, as as is from from Google and the majority of the time you are not Google, right? So you should account for for what is what they did, for what they did good and then try to to contextualize in within your company and business, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to the ops in that sense. But if but from a title standpoint, mm -hmm. site reliability engineering makes more sense than the ops engineer. You are right. It's it's more of a job function than the ops engineer. So it's like if you if you call okay. Since it it came out from DevOps, can I call every DevOps engineer in in quotes every DevOps engineer as a site reliable engineer in that case, or are there another or couple more? No, no, that's more specialized. That, that is probably that is probably not applicable. Yes, SRE is gonna be is going to be more specialized than okay. than DevOps. DevOps. So a DevOps engineer could be either do could be either do like only infrastructure work. Mm -hmm. It could be only doing dev tooling mm -hmm. with focus with the focus of providing the tooling for the developers to make easier for them to do to do their work. It could be focused only on on like building a platform. So like yeah. you will do actually be doing is like pro work from the point of view that you are building a platform mm -hmm. for your for your end user, which are all the developers. But you may not be doing a uh, like uh, on call or yeah. or taking care of the deployments per se mm -hmm. on that uh, on that platform. So when we talk about SRE, and again, like it's usually context dependent on the company. Like so, yeah. there are like different. Def there is no one unique definition mm -hmm. unless you look at the SRE in the Google definition in the book of SRE. So it's gonna be like focus on like maintaining like a certain set of services, and they take care of operations of all the operation aspect of that service, hmm. like maintaining up and running that it, it complains with uh, the SLAs, like the service level agreements for mm -hmm. the service, uh, like observability, monitoring, um, make sure that it doesn't go over the too much of the SLA in, in order to provide like the, the proper amount of uh, reliability. And one thing that they did introduce as part of the SRE that it, it wasn't as known before, is the focus for the SRE on on engineering and automation. So you need to, if you're doing SRE, and in general, if you're doing DevOps, you should cap the amount of uh, manual operation and firefighting that you have to do. Because usually that, the amount of operation and manual toil that you need to deal with on a daily basis is gonna increase as your company increases, as your product increases, as your uh, headcount increases, because you, you have to account for more people more more resources, more traffic, and a whole lot of other um, interdependencies. 
So the only way to keep up is through automation and software engineering. So for SRE or DevOps general, you, you mean? Yeah, that's applicable in both cases, in both cases, but that was brought up to the front, mm -hmm. to the forefront by the SRE of, mm. and the SRE definition in, in Google. Okay. Yeah. Now, now it's a bit more clear, at least to me. Um, yeah, we have some, like we have SRE engineers and we have DevOps, DevOps team at work, uh, in our, in our company, but I was always uh, try like struggling to, uh, identify which one does which thing, you know, it was always like unclear. There, there are always unclear boundaries saying, okay, I ask questions to wrong people. For example, they say, ah, no, this is yeah. SRE, then go to SRE. <laughs> that, that would tend to happen. For, for what I've seen, usually when, when you have the division between SRE and a DevOps team, usually the SRE is going to be focused more on like in the infrastructure, the, all the, the monitoring, the, the deployment automation, observability, and making sure like the, all the services are, are running as they are supposed to be. And then the DevOps, the DevOps team uh, within the general DevOps group is going to be focused more on like dev tooling, some internal platform for, for the developers, mm -hmm. uh, managing the pipelines uh, or the building blocks of the pipelines and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. Now I want to focus on a bit on the career side because, um, that's where I'm a little bit more interested. Um, mm. since I'm not a DevOps engineer, but I want to learn a bit, um, how does a career path look like for, for DevOps? Okay, DevOps engineer title might not be correct term, as you said, uh, but um, if if someone is curious and would like to learn and grow as carry their career on that path, first, where they start? Second, where they go? In which way? Of course, it's a very wide area, but yeah. do you have some, I don't know, some, some things that they can identify and foresee before? Yes, and... And some of those things I, I, I learned them through, through experience mm -hmm. and, and mistakes on, on my own as well. So I would say that there are, there are two differences. You may be brand new to the, to the industry, like you just graduated from college or a boot camp or self, self taught and you're looking for your first job, or you already have experience in the industry. Like you're a front end or back end engineer or, or a sysadmin or IT operations and you are looking to move towards uh, uh, towards DevOps practices. So if you're starting from scratch or brand new, and then it's somewhat a little bit harder, in my opinion, to get into DevOps. Usually, companies tend to look for people that have somewhat already uh, software engineering experience or sysadmin experience or IT operations before jumping into into DevOps. I mean, it can be done. Like companies are contra are hiring junior positions. But in those scenarios, like I would say the most important for, for the, for the person would be, uh, they need to be interested in covering all the software development life cycle from end to end. And that's something that I realized that, that uh, for me, it was important from the beginning because I was learning how to code. I was building program, but, I, but as soon as, as I had to start focusing on like deploying what I was building and I realized how messy it was back then, it was like, it has to be a better way. Like I, I cannot remind deploying this, like deploying features like this for the rest of my, of my life. So I started to explore, um, in GitHub, uh, at the time it was hard in Cuba, but we were able, we have some minimal internet access and how to start deploying. I got in, I found out about Heroku, which is a pass platform and it make it easy to, to, to deploy your, your code, especially back then that was like a, it looked like a miracle to me. So, Getting in, get, starting to get in touch with uh, deployment practices and how to build your software from all the way from code to deployment. That's how I would say that you you want to start and getting familiar with all the high level uh, components of of DevOps, like co coding, of course, uh, how you build your continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. Then what happens when you deploy? where you're going to deploy that you need to define where if you are deploying directly to a server or if you are deploying to a platform as a service or or if you're deploying to cloud and be mindful of the difference in those in those scenarios and then what happened after you deploy like how do you see how do you verify that your your code is doing what it's expected to do after deployment and the health of the services that where the the system is up and running and is doing doing fine and then after you have 
that high level overview, then you start you can start focusing down on a particular niche that interests you the more, right? But once you have these uh, high level overviews, which you can achieve in with open source projects and you can get involved or from your own open source projects, you can start by uh, creating a, ploy, a project and configuring the all the CI CD process with GitHub Actions and deploying to any of the free offerings that Heroku, DigitalOcean, and Nellify, for example, all of them they have free offerings and that give you that give you that first uh, introduction to the to the area and you can take it from there. Like and depending on the particular company that you that you get into, that may be a completely different scenario, of course. But having those high level knowledge and then building the fundamentals is gonna allow you to go either way. Now for the other side of the the other side of the of the question, like if you already have experience either as a software engineering or as a sysadmin and IT operations, then I would say one of the more one of the important things is a start to be uh, open to different to a different point of view. So if you are from software engineering and you are used to to like everything have to be written in code and we don't do anything manual, then you need to start understanding why some things are being done manually nowadays because there may be like historic reasons of why that is happening. So it's not like I'm gonna be at the bobs and we're gonna do everything now my way, like coding and everything. No, that there is a balance that you need to understand. If you're coming from a ops uh, traditional sysadmin and operations team, then you need to start like focusing on learning code and in, in learning better how to code probably. That's a, an important one. And getting exposed to all these different practices of infrastructure as code, and automation deployment pipelines instead of like one of a script, like how to build reusable components that can be building blocks for other uh, future projects. So usually I think the, the, the most important thing there is gonna be a, a mindset shift from you. What are you traditionally traditionally doing either on software as a software engineer or a traditional sysadmin into this new world of uh, DevOps engineer? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great answer. <laughs> I, uh, I'm I'm thinking like, do I have a question about that? I really don't have. It's like, <laughs> it's like okay, now my, all my questions resolved. But I'm not sure if ever, anyone has a question from our uh, viewers or listeners. That so you can you can ask your questions um, if you are watching or listening this. Um, but yeah, it's like I, I'm a software engineer, and my point of DevOps was a little bit changed. Uh, when, as you said, when I look a bit in a different perspective of, I mean, okay, now this is another area. I mean, I was writing, I was trying to deploy some services via Travis uh, CI and trying to like write some YAML file, which tra tra make the Travis do its job. <laughs> Basically, I was like really annoyed not being able to like make it faster and etc like okay now mm. i have the docker as well okay but what am i gonna do with these and everything comes together and it's like okay now it takes i don't know 20 minutes let's say now it's, it's too long now how can i make it shorter because i don't want to wait 20 minutes every time I, I make a change to see it is live then when i started looking at it, these kind of perspective then it's i realized it's like okay now this might be part of DevOps uh, practices because that's, I mean, basically trying to make uh, delivery faster, deployments in a more efficient way, and etc. And I'm I'm not a DevOps engineer, uh, <laughs> but that's like if I want now if I want to have a switch to a DevOps engineer, I have kind of an answer already. <laughs> Good. Yeah, now I'm now okay. Now I have some 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 thoughts now. So all the things we are talking about, then what are the benefits am I gonna get from DevOps? Like, let's say I became a DevOps engineer, and I say, okay, okay. I, I I don't know, I chose one of the paths that you now recommended. Now, what benefits as a person, as a career, am, am I gonna get in general? Okay, let's start from the probably the most important one for a lot of people, like. DevOps is nowadays one of the best paid jobs yes. in, in the industry. It's one of the more in demand. So you get money. So right? you're, yeah, if money is important to you and it is important for everyone yes. up to a certain point, then you are not going to do wrong uh, going with uh, DevOps. Beyond just that, um, being on 
being on DevOps is going to expose you to to a lot of, of different areas. And not only within DevOps, but with our teams. And not only not only the development or, or product teams, you're only going to be in touch. You're also going to be in touch with uh, security folks as you start to integrate uh, security within the the overarching DevOps uh, strategy and also interacting with customer support and uh, compliance and mm -hmm. finance and like eventually it's, it's possible to to reach out to to the, the whole the whole company so that's something you you get, ex, you get exposed and you're going to learn a, a lot of different things and then you need to decide if you want to learn if you want to go deeper into a particular area or if you want to continue to to grow in your your knowledge horizontally between different areas um besides that at least for me and this one is more particular for me like being in devops has given me the ability that no matter what no matter in which project i'm on or which context i know that i can take it from 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 the beginning to the end by myself if i have to like i'm, I'm i know how I, I i know how to code i I, use, I was software engineering before like getting into devops i know how to do to build deployment pipelines and if i don't know for this particular one i know that i'm capable of uh, figuring it out and learning how to do it deploying a management post deployment uh, related uh, task so can, um, can we call you a self reliable engineer now <laughs> <laughs> well maybe um also and um, this one may this one again may be more particular to to my current team mm -hmm. than and it may not be applicable in other companies we do have a lot of freedom on on how we organize the work we do of course we have some time works that are related to 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 product engineering or to marketing or other companies that takes or other parts of the company that takes priority but in general we have a lot of freedom organizing like we, we are going to focus on this and we have discussions and this we're going to decide for this and if we get to find something that you want to improve uh, that is going to have like wide risk benefits and you can allocate the time for it and do it and that's something that i enjoy a lot and it was in my previous experience working as a software engineer that the scope and the reach of the things that i could do were way smaller than, than what i can do now so i would say those are my three main or four, four main benefits yeah i think the most people are yeah at this i'm i might be starting to, with the uh, um so you might convince me starting from the money. <laughs> I, yeah. But I want I wanted to be clear on that because the lot of you, you can see a, you can see a lot of, a lot of a lot around in tech in tech that people are are going to be saying that you need to have passion that passion is the more important thing and I do agree that passion is a good thing to have for the for tech because you are always going to be learning new things and I do a lot of open source project and and I and I blog and I tweet about the DevOps so I'm passionate about but i but i also recognize that money is is a big uh, influence for people to make decisions and and the ops is usually well paid so it's a win win in my case <laughs> <laughs> yeah i personally i um i understand the passion so like i have passions on software as i am also like what i what i'm trying to do here as well this is one of the passions that's related to that one um on the side I don't like saying people, ah, money is not a problem because no, it's not the case. <laughs> and when people only say that, yeah, you do you have the passion, then it's perfect. You don't need the money. You don't need to think the money, no. And also surveys are also showing that from, I think from Stack Overflow, mm -hmm. it's like the most uh, important point is money because that's what they are doing. They are trying to live here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, now um i wanna quickly um talk about because that's what i'm curious also on the side um devops like in on call thing again in the on call talk we talked about that devops changed the on call culture in general devops reshaped it um and then as uh, serhat said before that it was uh, like a one team's job and it was it's, as far as i remember it was like more on the strict points so it was not very agile let's say and then devops changed this culture now it's more in a everyone's responsibility not only one person's or one team's only 
but as you also said that it's from devops and also some engineers who worked on the services and etc they all take care now i'm curious what has devops changed i mean we we as we talked with Sarah before on call changed yes okay um as in also devops as you said previously that it's a agile practice kind of or born mm -hmm. from agile i don't know uh but what else did it change in both culture and also in the business so in terms of culture i would say that the biggest impact that devops has had across across the, the industry in general is is helping teams uh, get together and align into how how to better serve the your customers or your users at the end like companies the the main strategy is to serve well customers to to increase retention and uh, increase revenue right before devops and before devops when companies has like these deep silos between develop development and operations and other uh, group as well but the focus started started on development mm -hmm. operations there were this confrontational point where devop development wanted to to release feature faster so end users could benefit from those features mm -hmm. faster while operations were focused on maintaining the stability on the system so the less the less changes we had then the increase likelihood that the system is gonna behave correctly because at the end the majority of the issues that we that we see on a day-to-day -day basis is pro is due to a to a new release to a new fe feature to a new change yeah yeah between 60 and 80 percent of the of the issues that you see on a day-to-day -day basis are somewhat related to a new change that was deployed yeah but then what devops helped demonstrated uh, across many iterations and many implementations on on companies was that there was no need for this constant tension. Instead, what we need to focus is on release faster and release smaller changes that benefits the development and the end users in the sense that features are available sooner. And it also benefits operations because since we have a smaller changes, the scope of what is going to be affected is probably going to be smaller. The, the blast radius of those changes is going to be also smaller. So it helps you to increase the, the confidence on, on your systems. And if you need to do a rollback or fix a change, it makes it easier to determine what is what is the cause of the of the problem because you need to look at less at less change than before. From the business from the business point of view, DevOps is an asset in my opinion. If you're not doing DevOps and as as part of this um, wide term of digital transformation now, nowadays, and in particular if you're not doing DevOps then you're gonna eventually lose to the competition because the competition is gonna release faster have better products with better uh, reliability and availability can get feedback from the from the users using your product faster if you are than you that that the company that is not doing devops and not only devops not only development operations also including security compliance on, and all these adjacent areas that benefit from a tight integration between teams working towards this common goal having happy customers. If I understand correctly, so the benefit of DevOps in terms of business is like you have the, like the faster development speed, like feature development speed because of many different things. You have uh, faster delivery and it means early feedback. You get more feedback from customer on the products or features that you are developing. And you said security is another benefit you have you have to take care of the security of your system. It's, I mean, unavoidable in these cases. And since also DevOps is operating between uh, between teams, uh, you have the more improved collaboration, let's say. Um, you have a really good collaboration. You have to have, there is no other way for that one. And also yours, you can scale easily, I think. That's one thing. It, it makes it easier to scale, definitely. Not only... And in, in two sense, yeah. you can scale your your business yeah. without having to scale. You you, ha you can scale your business faster in relation to the number of people that you need to run the business because you are leveraging like a, a lot of automation, a lot of good practices, and it makes it easier for for one people to do the job that before required three people or five people. So you don't need to scale in terms of hiring people while you are scaling a lot on the business. Yes, and it also like with 
all the newer practices that you see around DevOps and especially cloud cloud computing, you can be more proactive about about how the traffic and the scale is going to behave, which in the in in the long term helps you to save money, which is also important. Oh well, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Last thing I think, uh, yeah. Last benefit I'm like trying to rethink back, um, and last benefit seems like the reliability that you have a better system, you have the more resilient system as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. on that topic, um, resilience is resilience and reliability are like very important part of the of the ops and SRE. I mean, it's part of the title of SRE. Yeah. So if you don't, it doesn't matter how good your service is. If it is if it isn't capable of serving your customers, no matter how good your code or how fast your code is, you're you're not you're you're gonna be out of business in eventually, right? So having reliability and all these practices around how to make sure that you have the right reliability, like chaos engineering, fault injection testing, and fault and um, be capable of determining how fault tolerant your system is, it is important when when designing and testing your, your system for for reliability. That's one open question, like like sure. really honest question. Um, is there any any team or company that you heard which highly implements the chaos engineering as much as Netflix does? Oof. I mean, Netflix is the gold standard, or yeah, that's what that I'm, I'm saying. They, they they set the standard, but the standard is very 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 high. <laughs> that is true. Um, I know about AWS teams that that do that. Like and it came in like uh, the rest of the cloud competitors, similar like Azure, Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. They also have those those services. I I mean, a few months ago or yeah, a few months ago, like AWS uh, released its own managed service for ca for chaos engineering. So it's making it easier for other people to take advantage of uh, of those capabilities with having without having to implement them in in house. Uh, like Netflix had to do at the time, right? Yeah. So I can imagine over time that's gonna get easier for people. And also, it had appeared uh, all these set of uh, like third-party vendors that provide chaos engineering on on full injection testing as a service. Like Gram, uh, the the one that comes to mind is is Gremlin, and they are one of the organizers of the of Chaos Conf, and they provide uh, chaos engineering as a service. So they are capable of integrating with your pipelines and systems. And with configuration, and in some cases, automatically, they determine how to to proceed. Yeah, I'm 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 glad to hear more more uh, companies because I was I was a bit skeptical on that point. Like, yeah, you need to I don't know, like, have to have the chaos engineering or maybe literally very very resilient systems that implement using chaos engineering uh, style is it's very hard. Just to conclude on that topic, I I just want to point out that just because Netflix did it. Your company, you, you don't have to do it, yeah. especially in the sense that chaos engineering is, is so high in the in your in your SRE or DevOps journey that bef before getting there, you need to you need to cover all of your bases, right? There is no point on doing chaos engineering if you don't have uh, if you don't deploy automatically your systems and if you don't if you don't manage uh, your infrastructure in a, in an elastic way. There is no point of doing chaos engineering there. Because if you have like fixed fixed servers, you cannot kill one of the servers and see what happens. That's that is never going to fly. So, getting there requires like a journey that is usually going to take years. It it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. And yeah, I I don't uh, I also like don't like following I don't know big or perfect very big good companies strategies directly blindly. It's it's it never ends up good, and 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 it's also like what you see out there from this company is the best they can do, but it's not, it, that doesn't mean that that is what they do on a day to day basis. Yeah, Absolutely. internally they may have like their own set of problems that they have to deal with, and that doesn't usually see the light, right? Yeah, yeah. Always the media side uh, in everyone displays the best. So yes. <laughs> okay, we are closely coming to an end, and I would like to um, ask my last two questions, which is the first one is what would be your top three recommendations for the people who would like to, like you gave some recommendations, but 
top three, like mm. top three recommendations for people who want to start or maybe advance their career. Let's say grow their career in DevOps. In DevOps, okay. So I would say first one, and probably the most important one is get familiar with the fundamentals of DevOps. Like what is DevOps? How how does it impact the business? Um, like the main concepts, what is, um, how do you unify the teams? And then the main components, right? Uh, what is continuous integration, continuous deployment, or capability and monitoring infrastructure of code, uh, cloud computing, like at least, at least the general overview, learn those things well, that's probably, then, and for that you can use like a, a lot of uh, literature available. I would recommend, I can recommend a couple of books, especially uh, the DevOps Handbook and Accelerate. Those are two of the best book on, on DevOps that, I, that I've read so far. Second, I would say you need to, you need to pick um, at least one, probably two language. One of them will be Go to learn, probably a good one to learn if you want to, especially as you dive deeper into the more infrastructure focus uh, side of, of DevOps, Kubernetes, Docker, uh, Terraform, all those uh, tooling, which are very widespread nowadays, like they focus on, they are built on Go and all the plugin and all the, uh, uh, all the ecosystem around, around those uh, tools are mainly on, on Golang. And then one, either Python or Ruby, also as a, as a more as a scripting language for, for building the, the type of glue scripts that you're gonna see on the different pipelines and different cron jobs and automation that you, you're gonna have as part of your different projects. Of course, that combined with Bash. Bash or PowerShell is gonna be anywhere. And the third one, so the first two, they give you the, the entry or the ability to, to grow up your technical chops in the industry. The third one, which I'm gonna say is your skills, your soft skills and how to properly communicate and understand and listening to people and convey your message properly. And the same message may need to be conveyed differently depending who you're talking to. So you need to be able to, to to express your message according to, to your audience. That's probably the, the, the third most important one, working on your soft skills. That's what is gonna allow you to grow the furthest. So the technical skills will give you will give you the entry point and are required to grow up to a certain point. But beyond that is the soft skills around communicating with people, convincing people, and being able to get like high level overview of the problem. And in some cases, very abstract problems that there may be or they may be not a solution, but you need to figure that out. And for that, you need to you need to leverage your prior technical experience and work experience, and combine that with your uh, curiosity and being able to to search online for for ideas and reach out to people. And as part of that, your networking, which comes back to the importance of your soft skills. Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, very nice recommendations. I would say. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Um, so I want to go to last round, and uh, my last question is the I I adapted this from a Ladybug podcast, um, and mm -hmm. I started asking people about their shoutouts. Uh, it can be anything. So anything that you want to appreciate in front of others, it can be book, or I don't know some person or some item, some stuff that you own and you really like. I don't know your shoe it can be also. Um, do you have a shout out for us? If I have to pick, so it's, it's two things combined, right? Sure. I, if I want to shout, uh, I would shout out, uh, Nicole Forsgreen. She's one of the author of, uh, Accelerate and, and I also think the, the DevOps handbook, but I'm not, not entirely sure. She's on Twitter, so you can follow her. She's uh, currently, she works at GitHub. She, she has an, has had an impact on bringing a more scientific approach to DevOps in terms of, of uh, doing analysis and research and determining like what does it mean to be a high performing team and the, a DevOps team uh, in particular and the impact of the tooling, the, the culture, the, the business on how well you can you can implement DevOps. I mean, I have learned a ton from the from the books on, and from their tweet account and from their uh, online online talks so great um, that's probably the, the the main person that i would that i want to shout out yeah the accelerate the book is on my list i think i have 
two books before Accelerate, but afterwards that mm. I, I'm planning to read that one. I'm I'm really yeah. curious because I hear a lot of good recommendations about it. Yeah, my definitely. Yeah, my shout out would be to actually to I don't know if he's here watching us. I don't know, but to CTO of Superpeer Fatih, the the system that we are recording this, uh, because we had a good, nice we had a nice session that I. I he had like we had a user interview i'm the user of the system it was really nice to directly sit with uh, the companies like direct cto and and even the, in that level they are trying to understand their users and it was really nice it was a really nice conversation i would say so my shout out goes to fati this week <laughs> that is pretty good yeah, yeah. Do, do you would you like to add anything else Rene? um just thank you very much for having me here and those, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and it has been very nice to to talk to you. Yeah. If anyone wants to stay in touch or reach out, uh, you can find me on Twitter and just get in touch there. Yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, joining today, Rene. It, I really enjoyed our talk and it was really uh, nice. Thanks a lot for don't uh, thanks a lot for being here, actually. Yeah. And people uh, don't forget to follow. I shared the links. Uh, also, and the, you will, you can find them in the description as well. Um, and uh, then, thanks a lot for watching or listening us, and see you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.